Okay, I think we are going to start. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to attend to our uh, Global Friendly Network webinar. My name is uh, Professor Gustavo Duque. I'm uh, the Kaufman Chair in Geriatric Medicine at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, and one of the members of the steering committee of the Global Friendly Network. So um, uh, today we are going to have a uh, a panel, uh, which you know, we, we organize usually a couple of panels a, a, a every year. Um, and uh, just before we go into uh, the panel, I just would like to uh, give you um, some information about the Global Frailty Network. This is an international consortium that we have created with the uh, intention and the aiming of uh, aiming to uh, develop uh, the research and clinical agenda about frailty worldwide. Um, uh, part of these uh, activities that we organize uh, is uh, these uh, webinars, and I, I think that it has been extremely successful on uh, getting a lot of attention from all over the world. Um, if you are interested on in, um, joining or participating in this uh, Global Frailty Network, we have our website, which uh, will be circulated and will be also is in the invitations that all the documents that you have received for this webinar and for other uh, sessions. Uh, and uh, also, uh, we invite young investigators to contact us because we want to promote the field of, uh, of frailty amongst the new generations of uh, health professionals. So with this, um, I would like to uh, thank our speakers for today, and uh, I will introduce them. Uh, I just will start, will start by letting you know that uh, Professor Roth Howard uh, cannot join us for uh, a very important family uh, issues. So um, I think that um, uh, we are going to have uh, more time for our speakers to uh, interact and uh, share with us some of the uh, new evidence uh, in this topic. So the topic for today is uh, sex differences in frailty. So the way it's going to work is we are going to have uh, two uh, separate lectures, short lectures by our guest uh, speakers. Um, and then we're going to have lots of interaction. So I encourage everyone to, uh, everybody to uh, write your uh, questions in the questions and answers function of the, of the webinar. And uh, we will try to answer as many questions as possible uh, and, uh, at the end of the session. Um, so I will introduce both speakers now, and then they will uh, start. Uh, I will start. I will uh, introduce them in the way they are, in the order that they are going to present. So our first speaker is Dr. David Ward. Uh, David is a research fellow in aging and geriatric medicine at the University of Queensland and chair of the Damon Network Networks Frailty Special Interest Group. David is particularly interested in how people's experiences, behaviors, and health conditions can affect their chances of developing dementia as they grow older. A key component of his research is aimed at understanding the complex links between aging, frailty, and the brain. And uh, Dr. Emily Gordon is a consultant geriatrician at the Princess Alexandra Hospital and a senior research fellow with the Center for Health Services Research at the University of Queensland. Uh, and uh, she has uh, she was awarded her MBBS in 2009 and completed nine years of clinical training in Southeast Queensland hospitals. Uh, in her current clinical role, Emily leads a multidisciplinary team to provide comprehensive geriatric assessment and management to frail other uh, adults in acute and subacute inpatient and outpatient settings. Um, she is considered an emerging leader in frailty research, particularly in the field of sex differences and pathophysiology of frailty, with a very strong track record of publications in high quality peer reviewed journals. Um, so I think that uh, we're very, uh, very uh, lucky to have two experts in uh, this field um, and to have, uh, you know, Australian representation here. Uh, and this is nice to, um, to, uh, have uh, this uh, topic discussed uh, as part of the seminars. So with this, I will just stop talking and I will invite Dr. Ward to uh, start his lecture. And as I say, don't forget to write your questions and answers. Yes, Professor Duke, I'll actually get things started and, and David will have a talk a little bit later. Um, thank you everybody for joining us for this presentation and, and we sincerely appreciate the opportunity um, to, to speak with you all. And yes, again, um, Ruth sends her apologies for not being able to attend today, but I hope myself and David can, can uh, leave you with some, some interesting ideas um, this morning. Well, this morning here anyway. But just to begin, 
Um, I first will acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodianship of the land on which David and I live with our families. We pay our respects to the ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country, and we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So to start, I want to just talk about three things that we all know. First, we all know Andy Clegg's um, frailty diagram from The Lancet in 2013. And secondly, we also know the definition of frailty. But I just want to draw some attention to the fact that we can think of uh, frailty in two components. Firstly, that frailty is a state of reduced physiological reserve, which then increases the risk of adverse outcomes. So frailty is a measure of health status, and it's also a measure of risk. And the third thing that we all know is that sex complicates everything. So how does sex complicate frailty? The objectives of today's presentation will be to consider whether women are less frail than men in terms of risk, then to consider whether women are more frail than men in terms of their health status. We'll then work through an example of sex, frailty, chronic disease interaction. And if we have time, we'll consider some hypotheses for the sex frailty paradox. And then we welcome your questions, comments, and discussion. So let's start with the question, are women less frail than men? Globally, in 2019, life expectancy at birth of females was approximately five years longer than that of males. But the female survival advantage has been a feature of the WHO Global Health Observatory data over the last 20 years and of historical records since at least the 18th century as demonstrated here. While average life, human life expectancy and the magnitude of the sex longevity gap has changed over time due to historical trends in communicable diseases, maternal mortality, risk-related behaviours and so on, the female survival advantage may in fact be one of the most robust features of human biology. There is limited evidence regarding sex differences in longevity prior to the last few hundred years of civilization. However, females outlive males in several other primate species, which may point to a long evolutionary history of the female survival advantage. In modern populations, sex differences in longevity are exemplified by the oldest old. I'd like to introduce you to Dexter Kruger. Dexter was a veterinarian, a cattle farmer, a poet, and an author. And he lived in a small uh, regional town um, in about six to eight hours drive from Brisbane, which is where David and I are at the moment. He passed away in 2021 at the age of 111 years and 188 days. So Dexter was very rare. He was very unique, not only because he was a super centenarian, but also because he was a male super centenarian. And he is our oldest um, male in Australia on record. As of May 2023, all validated living supercentenarians were female, of which there were five. And in preceding years, the female proportion of this population has been consistently greater than 90%. But what about sex differences in mortality rates as opposed to a life expectancy? Higher mortality rates in men from young adulthood is a relatively stable feature globally although the exact ratio and contribution to sex differences in life expectancy varies across historical periods and countries. Here, we, in, in the figure on the left, we have the ratio of male to female deaths at different ages in Russia, Japan, US and Sweden in the latter half of the 20 teens. As you can see, the ratio of males to female deaths is always in excess of one. In general, the male-female mortality ratio peaks around 25 years of age and again around 70, although the second peak is becoming less pronounced overall. But deaths of young men between 15 and 40 years of age account for only a modest part of overall female longevity advantage. On the left-hand side here, you can see that since the 1950s, high male mortality after the age of 60, as indicated by the yellow and the brown sections, are largely is what largely determines the life expectancy gap. But there are notable differences between countries. For example, in Russia, deaths in males above the age of 40 um, contribute to the, to the sex longevity gap. But the female survival advantage has not been accompanied by health advantages. At a global level, healthy life expectancy as a proportion of life expectancy at birth 
has been estimated to be 88 to 89 percent for males and 84 to 87 percent for females. So women live more years with poorer health, partly due to their longer life expectancy, but also due to, well, poorer health. So are women more frail than men? And the evidence from community dwellers would suggest that they are. In Collard's systematic review, which is on the left here, in which two thirds of the studies adopted a physical frailty definition, most of which was the Freed Frailty Index or the Freed Frailty Measure, a meta-analysis of data from over 40,000 participants yielded pool frailty prevalence rates of 9.6% for women and 5.2% for men. And in 2017, my colleagues and I conducted a meta-analysis of frailty index data from over 37,000 participants which is on the right-hand side. This is just one snapshot of one age group. But we consistently found that women had higher mean FI scores than men of the same age. The mean weighted difference in the FI between males and females ranged between 0.02 and 0.06. And that corresponded to between 0.8 and 2.4 additional frailty index deficits for women compared with males across the different studies. Given that we now know that a change in the FI of 0.03 is considered to be clinically significant, these results are indicative of very important differences in health status between the two sexes. But in 2021, Collard, myself and our colleagues were trumped by this huge meta-analysis by um, this team. They uh, did a systematic review and meta-analysis of over 62 countries across the world, over 500,000 adults over the age of 50 years. Thankfully, they generated the similar results. So we can see on the left here, using all types of frailty measures, female, the prevalence of frailty in females was 20% compared with 14% in males. And again, if it was measured using a physical frailty measure or a frailty index, there was a similar pattern of deficits. So it would seem that in community dwellers, older community dwellers of all ages, sorry, older community dwellers um, using different frailty measurement tools um, higher female frailty is a, is a relatively stable feature. But what, across, what about across the lifespan? In the meta, uh, systematic review and meta-analysis we did in 2017, we looked at um, adults over the age of 65 and found that the difference in the frailty index scores between, males and fe uh, between females and males was consistently higher, uh, indicated consistently higher FI scores in females across the lifespan. So here we have 70 to 74, all the way through to 100 plus years of age. And Cantor's in 2017, using some Canadian data, looked at middle age, so 45 to 54 and 55 to 64, and also found that the prevalence of frailty using a frailty index cutoff was also continued to be higher in females compared with males. And across the globe, it seems to be a fairly stable pattern. Sex differences in frail to be have well documented in Western and non-Western populations in high and middle income countries. The red stars here are indicative of studies conducted in, in individual countries. We also have these blue stars, which are integrative analyses, which include um, data sets from North America, from Europe, from Australia. There's been um, fewer studies conducted in lower income countries, a few recently, um, one from Africa and one from Indonesia, which also demonstrated a similar pattern of female frailty being greater than male frailty. Economic categorization of countries does not capture the nuances of race nor ethnicity within a population, and much less is known about sex differences in frailty in ethnic minorities. In the United States, frailty is more than twice as prevalent in African American women compared to white American women. And data from indigenous ethnic minorities such as um, Native Americans, Aboriginal Australians, and New Zealand Maori populations also indicate higher frailty, whether that be prevalence or mean scores, in women compared with men. But then what about other settings? So sex differences in frailty have also been examined in the acute care setting. I apologize for the blurriness of this image, but this recent systematic review, which included over 460,000 adults in hospital over the age of 65 years, found a 7% difference in frailty prevalence between women and men. However, this was not statistically significant. 
My colleagues and I found similar results in a study of frailty in older inpatients using the FI. I was initially pretty annoyed to find out that it wasn't included in the previous systematic review, but it's okay, it didn't quite meet their selection criteria. So we found that the mean FI in women, um, so their FI measured on, a, on, a, on admission to hospital, was higher than the mean FI in men, so 0.34 compared with 0.31, but this difference was not significant when we adjusted for age. And as you can see here, in both sexes, the frailty index in hospital was distributed normally around its mean and the slope of deficit accumulation approached zero. These features being consistent with older inpatients being an unwell hom hom homogeneous um, population. But when we looked at the same patients pre-admission baseline FIs, so frailty indexes re um, regarding their status two weeks before their admission to hospital, the mean FI in women was again slightly higher than men, but again, it was not significantly different when adjusted for age. The distribution of the FI was again normal for both sexes, and when we looked at the profile of deficits that made up the frailty index, they were similar between the sexes. So overall, the results from the hospital data suggest that sex differences in frailty may be a phenomenon of heterogeneous community dwelling populations. And this is also supported by data from the nursing home setting. Um, this systematic review, it was eight years ago now, and it was relatively small, but again, we can see that there's a high prevalence of frailty overall, and there's a, a, a suggestion that maybe female uh, women are, are more frail than male, but overall, it's not a significant difference between the two. So here we arrive at these answers. Are women less frail than men? Well, yes, um, because they're less vulnerable to death, but then are women more frail than men? Well, also, yes, because they have poorer health status. And multivariable analyses, which looked at sex differences <clears throat> in risk of mortality when adjusted for age and for frailty, for example, the frailty index, found that women had somewhere between 20 and 50% lower risk of death than males or men of the same age and same frailty status. So here we are at a sex frailty paradox. This um, prompts us to ask, well, why and how are women less or more frail? Why do women live longer than men? So there are many hypotheses regarding mechanisms underpinning the sex longevity gap. Fundamentally, females have two X chromosomes and males only have one. So maybe this confers some sort of advantage for females. Maybe X chromosomes contain particularly important longevity genes. This hypothesis has some support because there is evidence of female longevity in other mammals, such as pilot whales, with the same XXXY design. Birds in captivity have the reverse chromosome complement, and there is some evidence for a reversal of longevity, but it's not universal, with some data from other mammals um, with the same um, uh, chromosome complement indicating that males live longer than females. Another key hypothesis for the sex mortality gap is that women are less likely to experience life-threatening or lethal diseases compared with men. The tendency for cardiovascular disease to occur 10 years earlier in men than women has been attributed to the favorable impact of estrogen on serum lipid profiles. Increased lifetime exposure to estrogen due to older age at menopause has been associated with increased survival, even after adjustments for education, smoking, BMI, and marital status. Testosterone, on the other hand, has been associated with shortened lifespan. Indeed, the lifespan of male Korean eunuchs was between 14 to 19 years longer than that of non-castrated men of similar socioeconomic status. Testosterone may also be a biological uh, driver for risk-related behavior. Males are more likely to be victims of accidents, suicide, and homicide. It never ceases to amaze me how many male trauma patients I look after elderly folk up on the roof, up on ladders, cutting down trees. Not folk, elderly men. Males have also been traditionally thought to be more likely to smoke, drink to excess in, and engage in other illicit drugs. And these activities may contribute to increased mortality through their contribution to the incidence of lethal comorbidities and also to accidents. Even after adjusting for sex specific conditions, Women have significantly higher number of presentations to primary care diagnostic clinics, and it's hypothesized that this may lead to better preventative care for legal conditions. Yet the evidence suggests that gender bias continues to disadvantage women with respect to diagnosis and management of important chronic diseases, 
particularly cardiovascular disease. And other studies have found that there's little difference in the time it takes for men and women to access healthcare in the presence of symptoms requiring prompt management, such as cancer-related symptoms. So overall, I'm not particularly convinced that uh, health, uh, help seeking and healthcare utilization impacts um, sex differences in longevity. But why do women have poorer health than men? Well, while women and men acquire new problems with age, women acquire slightly more overall. Furthermore, women appear to be more likely to acquire disabling conditions such as arthritis, cataracts, autoimmune disease, anxiety, and depression. And the data suggests that women are more likely to receive potentially inappropriate medications, particularly sleep medications, antidepressants, and analgesics, and experience higher rates of medication-related harm. It's also well documented that women report and experience more disability than men. High prevalence rates of sarcopenia, along with lower levels of physical activity, are strongly implicated in the development of functional impairment and frailty in women, as is the co-diagnosis of depression and other mental illnesses. While it has improved over the generations, women continue to be socioeconomically disadvantaged. Ethnic minority women are particularly vulnerable. In Australia, for example, approximately one third of Indigenous women complete secondary education or its equivalent, compared to two thirds of non-Indigenous women. Educational attainment impacts health outcomes via several mechanisms, including health literacy, employment opportunities, income level, and uptake of adverse health behaviours. As mentioned before, women do access primary care more than men. I think it's feasible that it may contribute to higher rates of diagnosis and prescribing. Higher rates of healthcare utilisation are attributed in part to differences in health seeking behaviours between men and women. And in this turn, this has been attributed to gendered social norms. And finally, sex differences in self-reporting behaviours, that is the tendency of women to over-report versus the tendency of men to under-report, are frequently cited as key reasons that women are found to be more frail than men. Certainly, most frailty studies have utilised clinical measures of frailty that include a self-report component. And studies that have used laboratory and test-based measures of frailty, classically frailty indices, have yielded more conservative estimates of female frailty and higher estimates of male frailty and no or no sex differences at all. So this raises a question about whether there are fundamental differences between the sexes or whether sex differences in frailty are primarily a gender difference related to self-reporting behaviours. So I'm sure many of you have noticed that I've been using a mixture of male, female, and men, women in this talk. And the title of the presentation, many of the slides, and even the paradox refer to sex differences, despite the fact that I'm also talking about gender. The terms sex and gender are interrelated and often used interchangeably. However, they are distinct concepts. Sex refers to biological attributes of humans and animals, including chromosomal complement, gene expression, hormone profiles, reproductive anatomy, and sex is typically categorised as male or female and determined by sex characteristics observed at birth or infancy. Gender, on the other hand, refers to socially constructed characteristics of people, including behaviours, activities and roles. Gender identity refers to a person's individual experience of gender and is typically categorised as boy, man or girl, woman, non-binary being an umbrella term for gender identities that are not exclusively male or female. In general, sex and gender have not been delineated in clinical studies, not just frailty studies, but all clinical studies. So if results are stratified by sex or by gender, it's actually not really known how this might relate to the participant's sex recorded at birth or their gender identity. And teasing, this, the, uh, teasing apart the impacts of sex and gender on frailty will be critically important to our understanding of frailty mechanisms. With respect to gender, seminal papers published 40 years ago proposed that roles assigned to men and women made it culturally more acceptable for women to be sick, to talk openly about their symptoms, to be attuned to their own poor health and that of others in the household, and to be absent from work. And this is why, at a population level, women utilise more healthcare, receive more diagnoses and more medications, and become more disabled and dependent. But over time, even in the last 40 years, with changes in education, family structures, cultural awareness and acceptance, among many other factors, less traditional gender roles have evolved. Nevertheless, gender stereotypes do persist and household and caring responsibilities still largely rest with women. At an individual level, gender identity may significantly impact health-related behaviours, such as help seeking and healthcare utilisation, 
The intersection of biological sex and gender identity as it relates to frailty has not been explored in the literature to date. However, in a prospective study of mortality from coronary heart disease, high femininity scores were found to be cardioprotective in males. And this association was independent of smoking, binge drinking, BMI, income, and systolic blood pressure. And in another more recent population study, female sex, but not femininity scores, were related to help seeking behavior in primary care. So it follows that we may see some interesting results if we look at gender, sex, and frailty in our community dwellers. Evidence from preclinical studies, and particularly mouse and canine models, support the hypothesis that sex differences in frailty are at least in part attributable to sex differences in biological processes. Recently, Susan Hallett and I wrote a chapter for Brocklehurst synthesizing the current evidence, and the topic is probably large enough for a seminar of its own. So in summary, there's increasing evidence for important sex differences in the pillars of aging, as, as presented here, but at this stage, there is limited data linking these differences to measures of frailty. Despite strong theoretical grounds, studies examining the relationship between sex hormones and frailty have yielded inconsistent results to date. And as a mother of two very long children, I was very invested in demonstrating that female frailty is at least in part attributed to the fact that we bear children. But my research to date hasn't quite uh, come up with the results that I was hoping for. So when David tells me that he's aging because of his small child, I have to just nod and smile. Activation of aging processes creates the ideal environment for the development of chronic disease. There's increasing understanding of the bi-directional relationship between frailty and chronic disease, which has been most extensively investigated with respect to cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's disease. There's also some evidence that this can differ between the sexes. So I'll now hand over to my colleague, David Ward, who'll talk us through the interactions between sex, frailty, and dementia. Uh, excellent, thank you very much, Em. Um, yeah, hi everyone. So my, my name is, is David. Um, I'm a, a research fellow with uh, Ruth and Emily, and um, I've been working at the University of Queensland for about eight months now. Um, in, in my previous couple of years, I was working with Kenneth Rockwoods in, Hel in Halifax and his team, uh, and a large focus of ours there was to better understand the links between frailty and dementia. So just in the next 10 minutes or so, um, I just want to cover some of the findings from our work um, and some findings from, from others, uh, and just talk about possible interactions between frailty, dementia, and sex. Um, but before we get there, so just first a brief introduction to the topic. So this is likely not controversial to most here, uh, but dementia of most causes is a problem of aging. Um, although Alzheimer's disease is the most common diagnosis given to older people meeting the criteria for major neurocognitive disorder, um, mixed pathology uh, in, in older, in, in later life is, is the norm. This was demonstrated really nicely in 2019 by um, that study cited there by pa Patricia Boyle and, and team, where they analyzed data from the Religious Borders study and the Rush Memory and Aging Project. Uh, and they showed that most cases of diagnosed Alzheimer's disease were instead um, actually attributable to uh, other brain changes that occur with aging. Um, so although it's not noted on this slide here, um, the, the authors found that almost um, a third of cognitively normal people had enough neuropathology in their brain that any uh, pathologist really would, would say that they probably should have dementia. Um, so there's a mismatch between uh, neuropathology and the expression of, of these cognitive deficits as, as dementia. So could frailty play a role in influencing the developments um, or the expression of dementia? Uh, as shown in this fairly simple figure here, um, there are at least two pathways uh, through which this could occur. Um, one is by influencing the rate at which people are um, accumulating these age-related brain changes. Uh, and, and the other pathway is, um, as we know, frailty is, is, is all about this, this reduction in, in, in physiological reserve. Um, and so that's another way that um, frailty could influence whether neuropathology that's present in the brain is actually expressed as dementia. Um, so next slide, please, M. 
And um, just to complete our introduction to this topic, um, when we start looking at sex differences and dementia, um, more often than not, um, there are sex differences that, that are found. Um, and that's, so the, these data are taken from a meta-analysis, um, quite, a, quite a recent one by Karen Atsti and her group, where they use data from a good number of studies uh, to assess differences in the incidence and the prevalence of dementia um, in men and women. Uh, you can see, so in the left there, the, the left column is incidence, the right column is prevalence. Um, you can see that for both any dementia in the top row and, and Alzheimer's disease in, in the bottom row, both incidences and prevalences appear to increase more as age increases for women than for men. Um, as, as vascular dementia tends to be more common among men, that probably is driving um, the observation that any dementia, the differences are a bit smaller. Um, but when we look at Alzheimer's disease, those differences are, are, are more pronounced. Um, so next slide, please, Em. But um, of course, em, Emily just established uh, well that women live longer than men. Um, so when, when we're drawing those comparisons um, in those older age groups, who are we actually comparing? Um, even though we're comparing dementia rates within narrow age brackets, uh, which goes some way to adjusting for some differences in, in longevity, um, we're still comparing men who are living longer than expected. Um, so you, you can see here that the life expectancy in Australia for, for men um, from a recent report is, is about 81 years on average, um, and for women it's 85. So in those age brackets that I've, I've circled there in red, we're, we're probably comparing men who are more robust than other men, because they're still going, um, to a wider mix of, of women. Um, who are likely um, frail, some frail, some robust. Uh, so this, this, this concept of talking about frailty and robustness um, and age and dementia uh, leads nicely into exploring whether frailty is playing a role in influencing these differences in dementia rates. So next slide, please, Em. Um, these are some criteria uh, that, that we came up with that we can apply to help us get at this issue a bit more closely. Um, so the first is, is frailty a robust risk factor for dementia? Um, the second is, does the prevalence of frailty differ between men and women? Um, well, Emily established that that's more complicated than a yes or no type of answer. Um, but already if, if one is true and if two is true, uh, then frailty is highly likely to be impacting these sex differences in dementia. Um, but there are other more nuanced facets that we can explore too. So does the additional dementia risk imparted by frailty differ in men and women? Um, and does frailty influence pathways to dementia differing in men and women? Um, so we'll go through each of these points one at a time, uh, with the exception of point two there, which um, I think Emma's already uh, discussed quite well. Um, so frailty is a robust risk factor for dementia. Uh, we, we and others have found that frailty is, is a strong risk for dementia. Um, and on this topic, uh, I just want to make three main points, really. The, the first is that the impact of frailty on dementia risk is large. Um, the second is that the method of frailty assessments doesn't seem to matter. Um, if you use a frailty index, if you use... Um, sort of physical frailty measure, both of those are strongly associated with dementia risk. Um, and the third point I, I, I want to make, and, and this is a, um, a, a common question we get in, in this field, is, um, you know, do, do the deficits that go into the frailty index, are, are they, are they prodromal symptoms of dementia, and is that why there's an association? Um, well, the answer to that is no, uh, and this has been shown multiple times, um, particularly in that um, lovely study by Zhao Wei Song and, and colleagues. So that figure on the right there um, is taken from a study that we uh, did using data from the UK Biobank. Um, we found that each 0.1 increase in frailty index score, which was equivalent to about five additional health deficits, that was associated with a 60% increased risk of dementia, 
Um, in the figure there, we've just grouped frailty index scores into low, intermediate, and high to visualize that. Um, but we did find a nice continuous association. Next slide, please, Em. So the next criterion um, that I listed earlier, um, although it's it's although it's definitely too early to state definitively, it does look like frailty as a risk factor um, is equally important in both men and women when it comes to uh, influencing dementia risk. So uh, this figure here on the right was taken from another of our studies where we used a multi-state Markov model to look at the impacts of frailty on transitions between different cognitive states um, using data from the National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center database. Um, what we're plotting here is the hazard ratios uh, that relate to the transition probabilities um, uh, for going from NCI to MCI. Uh, NCI here stands for not cognitively impaired, MCI obviously mild cognitive impairment, um, and from MCI to all cause dementia. So the top two rows of results there are um, forward transitions, so to a state of worse functioning, the bottom half of backward transitions to a state of um, better functioning. Uh, what we found really is that um, there were no statistically significant differences um, between men and women in the relationships of frailty and any of those transition probabilities. And that finding is consistent with evidence from UK Biobank, um, which is cited there on the slide as well, where the authors uh, showed that the associations of pre-frailty and frailty uh, with dementia risk uh, were not different between men and women either. So despite this, um, there is a publication from 2019 that did find differences in the associations of frailty with cognitive decline before the onset of clinically significant cognitive impairments, um, but we're not sure yet why that's not playing out in these other studies. Next slide, please, then. Um, the next criterion was um, relating to how frailty might um, influence pathways to dementia differently in men and women. Um, so frailty is a strong risk factor for dementia in both men and women, and that's quite equal. Um, but for this criterion, I, I want to go back to um, a study that we published in the UK uh, using UK Biobank data to highlight um, some of the interesting results that we found there regarding the impact of um, sex on the contribution of frailty to different pathways to dementia. Um, so first, and what's what I'm showing on this slide is that we wanted to look at how frailty might be involved as a mediator in the relationship between healthy lifestyle behaviors and incident dementia. Um, so that's uh, demonstrated there in that, in that figure. Um, in, in the middle figure there, uh, the first thing we did was we looked at how this healthy lifestyle score, um, which was comprised of uh, behaviors like um, having a healthy diet, um, uh, consuming a moderate amount of alcohol, not smoking, um, and exercising regularly. We, we looked at how um, each additional healthy lifestyle behavior was associated with dementia risk. Uh, and we found that as more healthy lifestyle behaviors were reported, um, people's subsequent risk of dementia went down. Um, and in the right, that little table there, um, what that is showing is that um, the indirect effect represents the proportion of the, the total effect on dementia risk that was due to the association between healthy lifestyle behaviors um, and frailty. So you can see that um, frailty mediated about 60% of the relationship between healthy lifestyle behaviors and dementia risk in women, um, but frailty only mediates about 35% of that relationship in men. So to us, this indicated um, that frailty is a a key pathway for conferring the benefits of a healthy lifestyle, um, of healthy lifestyle behaviors in women, um, but less so in men, where in men, other pathways that were at least unmeasured in this study um, played a larger role. So next slide, please, Em. Uh, in the same study, we also looked at the relationship between a polygenic risk score for dementia, um, dementia as the outcome, and frailty. 
And we found that uh, people with higher polygenic risk score were more likely to develop dementia. So that's shown there on the left there, and that's not a surprise. Uh, but interestingly, uh, we found that a higher degree of frailty was found to considerably weaken uh, that relationship. Um, and that was much more present in men than in women. So although women who are more frail, um, we also tended to observe a slightly weaker relationship between this polygenic risk score and dementia. Um, it, it, it was strong in men. So you can see that um, in men with low frailty, high polygenic risk score, increased dementia risk by about 34%. Um, but in men with high frailty, the red bars, um, there was essentially no relationship present between polygenic risk and dementia. Um, so to us, that indicates you know, one possible explanation for that is that, high frail, uh, that men with high frailty, um, their dementia risk is essentially already saturated um, and other risk factors are no longer uh, playing strong determining roles. Um, but in women with high frailty, it looks like other risk factors such as genetics and probably others um, seem to still be influencing dementia risk. And in women, maybe outcomes are possibly more modifiable to, to, uh, for that reason, but um, much more work is needed here to clarify these findings. So last slide, please, Anne. Um, so for me, uh, the conclusion is to take away um, looks like women tend to be more frail. Uh, they do tend to have more dementia in older age. Um, frailty is an important risk factor for dementia in both sexes. Um, and some sex differences do seem to exist, which, which I've just covered there. Uh, but more research is, is needed on this topic um, as per usual. So that's all from me. Thanks for listening. And Professor Dick, I just have some final musings, if I may, um, before we wrap up. Sure, no problem. Please go ahead. So I just thought I'd briefly um, bring us back to the sex frailty paradox so we can just leave you with some interesting hypotheses to some additional interesting hypotheses to mull over. Um, so earlier, I outlined several hypotheses regarding the mechanisms of sex differences in longevity and health status, but these explanations, when considered in isolation, do not address the question central to the paradox, which is why is it that women are able to tolerate poor health better than men? That is, why do women have a lower risk of death despite being more frail? And many hypotheses regarding the paradox relate to the uh, frailty as a measure of health status. I won't go into these uh, in detail in the interest of time, but uh, just to mention briefly that the leading or at least the most enduring hypothesis is that sex differences in the nature of chronic disease is the key contributing factor. The idea that women are more likely to experience conditions associated with high morbidity and low mortality and men are more likely to experience conditions with high mortality. The other theory is that it transpires because women have greater physiological reserves than from men, which would enable women to acquire more deficits in multiple organ systems without succumbing to death. And some of the potential mechanisms include non-random X chromosome inactivation, uh, sex differences in the balance of pro and anti-inflammatory processes, and important sex differences in evolutionary design. There's also a hypothesis that the sex paradox is, is that health measures, which include the frailty measures, do not adequately capture health deficits in males, as suggested by the results of laboratory and performance-based FIs that, we've that I've talked about before. But I do just wonder more and more about sex differences at the point of stress and recovery, and robust, which relates to robustness and resilience. And at this stage, um, very little work has been done in this area. So in summary, we've asked a number of questions um, about women being less frail, more frail, why and how, and how this may relate to sex frailty and dementia. And just very briefly touched on the question at the center of the paradox, but now um, David and I would be very, um, would welcome any questions or comments or discussion and we'll do our best um, to, to answer those. Thank you very much. Uh, Emily and David for your fantastic presentations. That was an excellent overview of this topic. Um, and I actually generated quite a lot of questions here, so I and comments. And uh, I will start with one comment, most a comment that uh, from Dr. Casa. Um, in your presentation and in other many research articles, females are prone to frailty. So uh, I believe that it is important to recognize that individuals should be evaluated and treated 
based on their individual abilities and health status rather than assumptions based on, she said gender, but I would say uh, the sex. Uh, what, what do you think about it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, geriatric medicine is, is always at, at the end of the day about individualized assessment and care. Um, I think this, um, these population level studies give us indications of what's happening at, at a population level. But as I, I, as I really wanted to, to touch on is that um, even though we, we're talking about sex differences here, something that is, that is highly variable and sits on a continuum is this, con is this idea of gender. So I think how people um, have operated throughout their life, um, not just determined by their biological sex, but also by their, by their gender or identity is going to inform how, how, what their frailty status is um, in, in later life. So I, I completely agree, but I think it, it is the takeaway message is that at a, at a population level, um, there are some, some clear patterns about um, vulnerability, but also resilience in women as opposed to men. Thank you. David, any comments about it or? I uh, know, I think M is probably the, the best one to answer that one. So happy to leave it with her. Perfect, thank you. Um, this is another question from Dr. Bogdanovic. Uh, does intrinsic capacity differ between fair, frail women and men? Intrinsic capacity. I haven't done a lot of work in intrinsic capacity. My understanding of it is that it is a similar concept um, to physiological reserve. Is, is that correct? Um, yeah. Professor Duke? Yes, yes, you're yeah. right. Yeah. So I think the, the, there is some indication certainly in the frailty um, work that there, in frailty index work, that there is some differences in physiological reserve. Um, so for example, um, there is some evidence that the mortality risk for males emerges at a much lower frailty index score than it does in females, for example. Um, so I think um, the principle, my understanding is that the principles are quite, are quite similar and um, I have contextualized um, one um, study in terms of intrinsic capacity, which was looking at a trade-off between parity um, and physiological reserve and, and the patterns of, of sex differences did appear to be similar. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, there is a question here from uh, Dr. Wisham. What components of a frailty index or physical frailty account for sex differences? Same question for dementia risk. Who wants to start, David? Yeah, I can I can comment on the um, dementia risk aspect. I think so. Um, one one thing that so I, I I tend to work with with frailty index scores um, and. A lot of the work we do involves um, removing certain, as possibly confounding deficits from that to sort of show that associations remain after adjusting for various in, um, more direct pathways to, to dementia. Um, something that we don't do so much is look at the, the sort of categories of deficits that, that remain um, and look for sex differences in those. But but I'm, I'd be pretty confident in saying that um, a lot of these indexes, indices um, include vascular components, um, and, and those would be more, those deficits would, would, would likely be more um, common among men. Um, I, I, I know that I think that um, a lot of the functional de deficits that we include might be more um, prevalent among women as well. Um, but I think that the sort of question of why, why is frailty a more influ influential pathway for possibly reducing mental risk from healthy lifestyle behaviors in women is a really interesting one. Um, and a lot of these questions will come down to differences, sex differences in um, like the pathophysiology of dementia. So what's the underlying cause of dementia? Um, differences in resilience factors. I, I don't really have a more detailed answer than that. Um, but those are my thoughts on it. And I don't know if you have anything to add. Um. Yes, as I mean, as every, um, everyone knows in the frailty index, for example, in these studies, they're, they are able to use a different variables to make up their frailty indices. So um, there, there is, however, some, some patterns of domains that tend to be a bit more affected in females um, than men. And you won't be surprised to hear that they are things like function, um, things like the presence of, of depression and anxiety, um, differences in, in self-rated health. 
in the hospital setting, um, we looked at the deficits in that inpatient setting and um, it did appear to be related to what the, what the men and women were coming into hospital for. So um, women were coming in with some fall, injurious falls, fractured knobs, um, those sorts of things. And so it wasn't a surprise to see that they were having more deficits related to things um, related to pain um, and function. Um, whereas the men who were coming in with other acute illnesses such as sepsis and malignancy related, et cetera, they did have those things, but it tended to be um, in that one, they, they tended to have more deficits in their, in their comorbidity counts. So um, I think that, um, uh, yeah, along those lines of, of those um, different domains that I was talking about that, that underpin differences in, in poor health status mainly. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Julian Falutz, um, first, thank you for these excellent presentations. And he asks, uh, what role do sarcopenia and depression play in frailty, especially physical and therefore to dementia? Who wants to start? Yeah, David? Um, I think, so depression, um, this, this is a, uh, a great topic. Um, and it's, it's one that's very interesting to me because uh, some of my current work is looking at how, um, you know, there, there's a whole host of modifiable risk factors for dementia um, that are quite well established and routinely talked about. Uh, and um, frailty is, is, is emerging as one of those. But I think something that we haven't done so much is look at how frailty is related to those other modifiable dementia risk factors, things like depression, um, and then really start to understand the, the pathways um, to dementia. So the idea of, you know, does, does depression come before frailty or does frailty come before depression? Well, both, both are, are likely. Um, does frailty come before dementia or does dementia come before frailty? Definitely both again. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, a good question. Um, and I, I think we need more work to really tease that apart. Um, but, but depression is a risk factor for dementia. It's a risk factor for frailty. Um, and, and for those reasons, I think it's part of the complex picture. Um, I don't know, Emily, if you wanted to talk about the sarcopenia component. Oh, we're talking about sarcopenia in front of Professor Duke is a, a little bit. <laughs> but, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say that females are probably more sarcopenic than males. <laughs> and, um, you know, there's lots of reasons from that for, for, from an underlying mechanisms point of view, very broadly, um, androgens are, are strongly implicated as well as chronic inflammation. And, and we do think that chronic inflammation probably plays um, a slightly more significant role in, in female frailty and, and female sarcopenia than it does in males. Um, the um, and, and, and a couple of the studies that have looked at the mechanisms of, of um, linking estrogen with with frailty I mean the postulated um, link there is is around sarcopenia, but they have found that that relationship is certainly mediated by measures of inflammatory markers, particularly CRP, and also the presence of abdominal adiposity, which which might be might speak to the person's general deconditioning, or it might speak to um, their a, a hyperinflammatory state that and and um, that we see in those individuals. And then with relation to depression, depression just seems to make everything worse. Um, and so um, that might, you know, why does depression also occur more so in females? Again, inflammation has been has been identified as a potential common link, um, but at a very clinical level, um, it is thought to make that mobility impairment and, and subsequent functional impairment um, uh, and recovery if there's been an acute illness worse. And, and we can all understand from a psychological point of view why that might be. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, there is a uh, question by Dr. Bray. Uh, great talk. David, could you expand on what you mean by your conclusion point? You say, in men, frailty may reduce the necessity of other risk factors for dementia expression. Yeah, certainly. Um, so thanks for the question. I think that um, over the last couple of years, our understanding of how frailty is related to dementia has increased quite rapidly. Um, I don't know if it's too early to call a 2019 paper a classic paper, but um, the, the, the paper that's often cited in, in, in this context is the paper by Lindsay Wallace and, and co-authors where um, they were one of the first to show that um, uh, 
had autopsy um, people who had uh, a higher burden of Alzheimer's disease. Um, there was a moderation of the relationship between that pathological burden and dementia when they're alive by frailty. So um, to, to say that in, in better words, uh, frailty seemed to be weakening the relationship between neuropathological burden and, and dementia in, in, in people when they were alive. Um, and that's not to say that people who were frail and um, had high neuropathological burden weren't at the highest risks of dementia. They were, it's just that the contributions from that neuropathology were much smaller. Um, so in that UK Biobank study um, by, by us the, the, that I cited there, uh, we found a similar effect where um, as people had a higher degree of frailty, the relationship between genetics and dementia became weaker. Um, and that was much more the case among men. And that's not to say that, that dementia, uh, that, that genetics were um, you know, associated with less dementia or, or anything. The highest dementia risks were still among the people who had frailty and, and high polygenic risk. So um, I, I guess what, what I was trying to say by that point is that in men who had high frailty, genetics didn't seem to be playing an influential role anymore. Um, and yet they were still developing dementia. So it just might be, and as, as I said, more evidence is needed here, but it just might be that um, in men with high frailty, that's almost sufficient to, to saturate their dementia risk. Other risk factors aren't impacting it as much. Um, so I hope that clarified it somewhat for you. Excellent, thank you, David. This is an interesting question here from a member of, uh, of the, of the uh, 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 audience. Uh, will these sex differences be affected, maybe in terms of research, taking into account the transgender population or individuals who have had gender affirm, affirming, affirming surgery or hormone therapy? Yes, um, I touched briefly on some studies that have looked at the um, the relationship that um, gender identity can can how that can impact um, outcomes um, in in different sexes, um, but the another way, of course, to look at this is to to look more um, broadly at the gender diverse population. Um, I recently reviewed a, a manuscript for JOGS, um, Journal of Gerontology, um, which has has validated a frailty index in a population of older. Um, sexual and gender diverse minority groups compared with non. Um, unfortunately, I, I couldn't present the results because it's it's yet to be published. It's it'll be it'll be coming out in, very very soon. But it um, it includes individuals um, who um, you know it synthesizes into into a, a composite score, I suppose, or it tries to anyway. That combination of what someone's um, biological sex, whether that's their sex that's been um, identified at birth, or whether it's um, the the sex um, that they that, that they that they currently are on the base of hormone treatments, etc., um, with their with their gender identity, and it's a really fascinating way to to look at this from a different perspective. And I'm so glad that it's been done. And I think um, the way forward. Um, is that all our, our data sets, um, our big data sets need to start trying to have them as, as very clear identified variables um, um, so that we can tease apart the, the gender sex impacts um, more carefully. Thank you. I wish I could tell you the results. It's really annoying, but oh, it's, yes. um, keep your eyes peeled. We will. <laughs> it's very interesting. So keep your eyes peeled. It should appear in the next month or two, I think. Excellent. So uh, unfortunately, the time flies and it's almost uh, 6 p.m. So um, and we still have for quite a few questions here. So you don't mind, you can stay after after we finish the session. The speakers can answer the the uh, can type the answers to their you know to the to the attendees. But unfortunately, we have to close the session today. And uh, I would like to thank, uh, of course, our speakers for their fantastic. Uh, fantastic presentations and panel and discussion. Uh, thank you for your attendance to these sessions. And, and again, invite you to uh, first uh, join or contact our uh, network. And, uh, and second, invite you for the next uh, series of webinars. We are preparing a fantastic 
set of, uh, of topics and speakers from all over the world, all thanks to your to your suggestions. We survey you after we finish this session and we will appreciate your suggestions in terms of what else do you want to hear about in the field of uh, frailty. So with this, uh, we will close our session today and thank you everyone for your, uh, for your attendance and have a rest, uh, nice rest of the day, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye.